Hi everyone, so let's take a look at the backwards bending supply curve of labour. Okay, before we do that, we're just going to understand exactly what the supply curve of labour is. Very, very simply, it shows the quantity of labour supplied to a market at a given wage rate. Okay, remember firstly that we're dealing with labour as a derived demand. So the demand is provided by the businesses that of course employ the workers and the supply is therefore provided by people that actually want to work. Okay, so the backward bending supply curve of labour perceives really that work is an inferior good. It believes that work is an inferior good. Now if you think back to the work that you've studied previously on income elasticity of demand, you wouldn't remember there perhaps that when it comes to an inferior good, it has a negative income elasticity of demand. So just as an example here, we can see that with this calculation of income elasticity of demand, if there is an increase in income, if income rises, then the quantity demanded of the good will actually fall. So really what we're dealing here with, of course, is a rise in income but at the same time, how much demand do you have? How much appetite do you have to actually undertake more work? Okay, so that's a very, very important element within this backward bending supply curve in helping you to really understand uh, the dynamics of this. Okay, uh, so therefore the higher the income, the fewer hours that people will wish to work. So when you are making higher levels of income, Generally, people will want to actually work fewer hours. Good example of this perhaps with Richard Branson, who now runs his Virgin Empire from uh, Necker Island in the uh, Bahamas. Uh, so he's opted to uh, take up more leisure time instead of working longer hours. Okay, now, this is our backward spending supply curve. We've got the real wage rate. We've got the number of hours worked per annum along our x-axis uh, and real wage on our y-axis. Okay, so if we just start at the bottom of this curve denoted in blue, we can see that initially there is going to be a very, very high substitution effect. Now, there's a positive substitution effect here because it's very, very profitable to actually start substituting leisure hours for work. When you substitute leisure hours for work at these uh, low income levels, you can see suddenly you increase your income dramatically and that obviously increases your purchasing power and increases your disposable income substantially. So as you continue to work your way up, up this supply curve, you are substituting your leisure time for work time. Okay. In essence, really, the opportunity cost of using your leisure time to not work is, is really growing, okay? There is an increased incentive, of course, to actually start working more hours. Now, then perhaps what happens, however, is that you have this negative income effect, and we see that the there's a negative income effect here, but that income effect is likely to be fairly small, okay? So the income effect really starts to kick in when you reach a target level of income. Perhaps you've actually said, look, this is how much income I, I would like to achieve or, or this is where I'd like to be in terms of the number of hours that I wish to work. Uh, and we see this point being achieved where we have parity here between the positive substitution effect and the negative income effect. Therefore, at these levels, we see that the worker is now unwilling to actually increase the number of hours supplied to work. Essentially, leisure time is becoming more and more valuable. As leisure time becomes more valuable, you need, um, you need time to actually be able to allocate your income and go and spend the money that you've earned. Now we can see then that the curve begins to backwards bend here and it begins to reduce the number of hours worked. So we've got a positive substitution effect, but this is far, far smaller than the negative income effect apparent here. 
Uh, okay, so we can really see that the income effect means that hours can be reduced and the target income can be maintained. And we see that at these higher levels here. So you can reduce the number of hours that you're working, but you can still sustain a very high level of income in doing so. Okay, so really that's certainly what Richard Branson has uh, achieved by uh, yeah, relocating his base out to the Bahamas there. Now there's a number of good examples of where we see this in action. So for instance, there's limits to uh, how much overtime people will want to work. And therefore you see big incentives in some lines of work, perhaps waitering, waitressing, uh, when it comes to Christmas Day perhaps. Um, but even then there will be limitations to how much work people actually want to take on. Uh, and further to this, there's also the fact that our, our leisure time has actually increased uh, across the Western world, not just in the UK, as countries and their living standards have increased and become far, far higher. So we've opted to switch away from working more hours in favour of more leisure time. Okay, we can expect something like that, of course, to happen in the future as China gets richer as well. Um, just relating that to your research theme if you're looking at that. Okay, but that's it. That's the backwards bending supply curve of labour. Thanks, guys.